What? Messenger. Oh, it's a text. I have your number. Yeah, check, check and see about your text. Okay, we've got a request to ask a question. Feel free to do that. Yes, sir, go right ahead. Why did you take a picture of a slide from your own PowerPoint presentation? Because uh, we try to be very active on Facebook, and we need pictures for uh, the Facebook, both for my personal timeline and uh, Facebook page, as well as for the public Facebook page of the ministry. It really helps to catch people's attention. So uh, everywhere we go, we post pictures of having been there so people can see a little bit about what it's like. And uh, one of the ways that we try to communicate little tidbits of information is by sometimes taking a picture of a slide. And so when people see that question, you know, what is it like to be widowed? It might be something that would catch somebody's attention and cause them to maybe go to the website, which is widowhoodworkshop.com, or try to find on Facebook, Widowhood Workshop Ministry. We don't have everybody back yet. Uh, I have a question for you. Okay. Texas, call, call what? Meta, Meta, oh, really? Yeah. Meta, M E T A? Are you talking about meddling? No. Meta. <laughs> no. What are you saying? It's the company Meta. Meta. Facebook. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I think Travis, only smart people call it that. I think us regular people, maybe not. <laughs> That's right, I'd forgot about meta owning Facebook. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Travis, how long you been married? Do you remember? How many? 52 years. That's over half a century. Boy, that is fantastic. And Travis is the... Uh, the deacon uh, in charge of widowhood ministry. I really appreciated him and Donna. They've taken a great lead in helping the church here to host this event. And I'm so thankful. So thankful that you are here. Yes, go ahead. Cheryl Wayne has uh, a booklet he's going to pass out to everybody. Notice how we try to freely distribute information. Uh, this particular booklet is written by uh, two brothers in Christ who are also physical brothers. They're twins, as a matter of fact, Don and Ron Williams. They've written this little booklet, How Can I Help Myself and Others in Times of Grief? It really is a great booklet. Uh, we buy these from the brothers, and then we distribute them to attendees free, folks who come to our uh, workshops, and we want to make sure that you have as much material as you could possibly... Uh, use to be of help to you or to be of help to you as you try to help other folks. Hey, I'm not an expert about this subject, let me admit that. I don't claim to know everything about anything. I'm uh, daily amazed at my ignorance. But one thing that uh, I have come to learn and understand and appreciate more in my life is that we can learn new things all the time. There are some things that I'm learning that I really wished I would have learned decades ago. I would have been a better husband. I would have been a better local preacher. I would have been a better brother and sister in the Lord. I would have been a better neighbor if I'd known some things that I'm only learning now. One of the, the most humbling things I think about getting older is how impressed that we can be about our ignorance. Just because we've lived a while doesn't mean that we've learned a lot. Uh, hopefully along the way we've learned some things. But then there are some life experiences that cause you to have dramatic increases in knowledge about things that previously you were totally ignorant about. I told you that I had become acquainted, I had come to know about the harsh reality of loss and its impact what I was still ignorant about until my wife passed away was life after loss. 
Loss is hard. Living with loss is harder. That's even hard to say. Loss has a, a really difficult impact. And that impact extends for the rest of your life. What we have to learn to do is live with our losses and embrace them, absorb them into our life, not let them define us. Don't let your losses, don't let any of your circumstances define you. But instead of letting them define you, let your loss be a part of you and use that loss to help you grow, bring more glory to God, and be more helpful to others. But we're not going to be very good at navigating the storm of loss and not very good at helping other people unless we know something about it. And that's what this session is all about. Some of the things that we're going to talk about, you're going to relate to very well. Some of you are going to be able to remember what that was like. I personally am in a very good spot in my life. As far as my healing, my recuperation, my life after loss, I think I'm in a very, very good spot. But I don't ever want to forget about how painful that it was when my wife died. I don't ever want to forget about what a tremendously difficult struggle it was every day and every night dealing with the reality of her being gone. I don't want to dwell on those things, but I don't want to forget them. Because me remembering those things is part of what motivates me to try to be a help to other people. So we can suffer loss without loss identifying us. We can suffer loss without it causing us to lose the value and meaning of our life. We can actually use our loss to help others. As a matter of fact, one of the mottos of the Widowhood Workshop Ministry is over here on the wall. It says, don't waste your pain. If you've been through a painful experience in your life, don't waste it. You've experienced it. You've paid a dear price for whatever it is that's been painful to you. Why not use that for the glory of God by trying to help others? Remember the people that are most helpful to other folks are folks who've experienced similar things. And not with arrogancy, but with humility, they choose to try to help other people. Your loss can be somebody else's gain because you can become somebody's inspirational source to help them navigate their painful time in their life. It's okay, again, to let other people know that you're a mess and that you need help. Fred Colby admitted the fact, after being married for 45 years to Theresa, his wife, that he was a mess after his wife passed away 45 years together. This is what he wrote. The greatest fear I had in the earliest stages of my grief that I was going crazy. That I was going crazy, that I was losing all control over my thoughts, and that I might make decisions harming me, my family, and my friends. That included suicidal thoughts. There's a lady who wrote a book that's back there on the table called The Widow's Might. And in that book, she wrote this. If I could have one positive thing come from Dale's death, it would be the ability to explain in words the utter overwhelming sadness of the loss. One of the primary differences between the death of your spouse and the loss of anyone else is that you have a level of physical intimacy with your spouse that you just don't have with other people. That, combined with the sheer amount of time you spend together, heightens the loss. Until you live it, I'm not sure that you can totally wrap your thoughts around the crushing magnitude of losing a spouse. Even as a strong woman with a powerful faith walk, a wonderful family, and a large support group, I was brought to my knees by Dale's death. I've totally changed how I think about life, marriage, and myself. Whatever happens... I will never be the same. 
One sister in the Lord in West Tennessee wrote this, never here anymore when I come home. Never been so lonely in my life. Staying busy does not help you escape coming home to an empty house. My kids do not talk about their daddy either. I've tried to explain to them how it hurts me that they don't talk about their daddy, for I know how much they loved him. But we cry, and they don't like to see their mama cry. So she wants to talk about her husband, about their daddy. But they don't want to talk about their daddy because they think talking about their daddy is going to make their mama cry. And therein lies some of the family struggle. One lady in Southeast Ohio wrote this, this is harder than I ever dreamed or imagined. Harder than I ever knew that it would be. I struggle to fight the weight that it seems I'm always carrying on my shoulders. One brother said in an email to me, he said, I had a difficult day today. I just came home from a vacation to an empty house. Then I went to a wedding today. The girl that was married was a favorite of my wife's when my wife had her as a student in one of her Bible classes, listening to the vows being exchanged, got to me. One lady wrote, the space inside of me, previously occupied by that passionate relationship, was strangely empty. I went from having someone think I was the most amazing person on earth to feeling invisible and vacant. Another lady observed, during the first year, it seemed like I was in a constant state of emotional agony. I would sit with a photo album in my lap and flip through pictures of a man I couldn't believe was actually gone. There's a book called Getting to the Other Side of Grief. If you're a reader, kind of a person, it's the book I would recommend somebody read because both a male and female participated in writing this book, Getting to the Other Side of Grief. He had a pastoral counseling background. She had a nursing background. And this is something that she wrote in that book. I wanted to kill myself. Going to bed at night was so hard, I prayed to God that he would let me die. I wanted out of this life. There's a brother in Middle Tennessee who I've helped start a local widowhood ministry there. He said, now I live in a time that I don't understand. It is a lonely world of darkness, and I don't any longer fit into it. I have no one to care for now but myself. The one I devoted myself to is gone. And then he said, frankly, my life stopped that day. This is not the way we planned it. My whole life is gone. She was not supposed to die before me. We held hands constantly for 55 years. We thoroughly discussed everything we did. She laid out my clothes every morning so that we would match every day. I eat out very little. Someone at church will ask me to join them, and I accept once in a while. I always go when church has an eating event, but who do I sit with? If I sit with a family, their conversation does not allow me to join in. This is because I do not really fit in. A lady in Arkansas, a member of the church, said, I wasn't a person anymore. Couples turned their backs on me. That lady, Buffy, who was an English teacher in a school in southwest Georgia, whose husband committed suicide. She said, eight years ago, I married my best friend. Eight years ago, I never imagined my life would be the way it is now. I never dreamed until death do us part. That part of our vows would become my 
reality so quickly. Marcia and her husband, Robert Stapleton, were missionaries in uh, Chamala in Africa for years. They were married for 47 years. Two years and three months after he died, after 47 years of marriage, here's something she shared with me. I know that I have to do my very best each and every day, but it is hard at times. This is a mature Christian woman, a preacher's wife, a missionary's wife. She said, I never dreamed it would be this difficult. Patty in Middle Tennessee is a sister in the Lord as well, and she said, the mornings are so lonely as I drink my coffee that he always made for me. I miss him reading the scriptures because he had been up for a while before me, and I long to hear that voice again. It's been 48 days, and the ache is almost unbearable at times. I've gained a new respect for all who have lost someone that was the best part of them. A widow in Arkansas, older Christian lady, said, I miss him so. Knowing he is in heaven does not stop the pain and loneliness of the one left behind. Leela in Ohio said, we did everything together. She and her husband were members of the church I preached at at Hartville, Ohio. She said, we did everything together for 48 and a half years. When a tiny germ, COVID, took his life. I'm struggling with extreme loneliness. The house is so quiet and no longer alive with joy. Hard. I never knew it was that hard. You know, in my 20s, and my 30s, and my 40s, and my 50s when I was a preacher, I had no idea that I had men and women in the church where I was preaching. I was number 12, by the way. Three weeks after my wife passed away, one of the things I did was I sat with the church directory, and for the first time ever, having been with that church for 32 years, you'd think I would have done it before, but not until my wife passed away. I sat down with the directory, a pad, and a pen, I started writing down the name of every widowed person in the church there where I preached. I was number 12. There were eight females, and I was the fourth male. And I thought, what a neglectful church leader I was. But it wasn't out of intent. It was out of ignorance. Greater knowledge of life after loss and the struggle that many people have. Admittedly, some people have less struggle than others. Most people have a lot bigger struggle than they ever dreamed that they would ever have. Remember, if they mattered, if they mattered greatly in your life, their absence is going to matter greatly in your life. And we're all human, and we're going to struggle with that life after loss. My favorite widow, no offense to all you other widows and widowers, this is Millie. I met her north of Cincinnati, Ohio, the Grosbeck Church of Christ, where I was preaching in a gospel meeting one week, and the preacher came to me, his name was Mark, and Mark told me, he said, hey, I've got a 90-plus-year-old lady who wants to take you out to lunch. Now, I'd been married for 41 years, and I had three daughters, and I knew it's not safe for a man to say to a woman, no. Especially if she's over 90, and so I said, Mark, go ahead and set it up. So this one day at lunch, she takes me to a Japanese restaurant, which I thought was weird. I did not know 90-plus-year-old women ate at Japanese restaurants, and that's where she took me out to eat. So the waiter came and took our order, and then he left. And I did the same thing with her that I love to do. I wish I could do it with every single one of you who've lost your spouse. If I have private time, I always ask the same question. I said, Millie, tell me about your story. She looked at me kind of strange, and I said, your love and loss story. Tell me about your story. 
She said, well, I was married to this guy for 63 years. And he was a, a good father. And she told me about those 63 years that they were together. She told me about when he got cancer. She told me about when she cared for him. She told me about when he died. And after telling me about that love and loss story, then she dropped a conversational bomb. She said, but that wasn't my first husband. And I was taken aback by that. I said, Millie, tell me about your first husband. She said, well, I was 19 years old. We'd already had one child, about a year, maybe a little older than a year old. And I was pregnant with our second child. She said, my husband was in General Patton's army in the Battle of the Bulge, and he died there. And I can quote you exactly what she said right after that. Quote, I had him buried in France, a decision that to this day I regret, end of quote. I thought about that, and I thought, mid-1940s, 19 years old, pregnant, and already has a child about a year old. How in the world did Millie navigate her life after loss? It was four years after that she met this other guy, and they got married, and were married for 63 years. Her first husband's name was Ray Farmer. If I ever go to France, I'd like to be able to find where he's buried. I can't tell her about that, though, because she died on July the 4th of 2018. Before she died, when I would do a workshop after I met her, I would call her on the phone and tell her, Millie, I told your story. I want you to know that I told your story. I wanted her to know that her story of life, love, loss, love again, and loss had great value and could have a powerful, inspirational impact on other people. We can live our life after loss. It's not an easy thing. It's a very difficult thing. Extremely difficult, more so for some than others. But it is uncharted waters that nobody wants to swim in. But we are dealing with forced change. What I want us to realize is that there are some risk factors that we need to share with other people. And the risk factors are basically say, I do, stick to it. And if your heart's the one that keeps beating, then you're the one that's stuck with the reality of life after loss. That is not an easy experience. There's only one way. Now stop and think about this. I didn't think about this until just in recent years. There is only one way for a good marriage to end. Do you know how it is? Death. It's the only way. Now, a miserable marriage can end in a lot of different ways. But, you know, diver the desertion, separation... I mean, domestic violence. I mean, there's all kinds of ways a bad marriage can end. But the only way a good marriage ends is death. You think it would be a good idea for those who are married to learn a little bit about the part after death for them? I think so. I want us to think out loud now together for a few minutes about things that in our culture we commonly associate with widowhood. What do we in our culture commonly associate with widowhood? Remember me telling you about Denny who sat back there, he raised his hand, he said, old. And that's when I explained to him that, yeah, but you don't have to be old to be widowed. But that is commonly associated with widowhood. Give me something else that's commonly associated with widowhood. Anybody. Let's do at least six or seven. Financial struggle. It can be a great financial struggle. How about something else? Donna? Loneliness. Loneliness is almost always the very first thing. You know, whenever you've lived and devoted yourself to a marriage relationship, and that marriage relationship and all those experiences have been so important to you, and then that person is absent now, dealing with that kind of loneliness is a much more challenging life experience 
than typical loneliness. Uh, Kathy Lee Gifford, you know, NBC, Today Show. You know, she used to live in the New York area. I've heard her interviewed, and I've also read in AARP magazine, one edition they had, a story about her. She was married to Frank Gifford, one of my favorite uh, NFL uh, New York Giant football players when I was a kid growing up. They were married for 29 years. He was way older. Why do you women marry older men? He was older, significantly older than she was, but they were married for 29 years. Now, in those interviews and in that article that I read, one thing that really struck me is how she described herself. She said she was painfully lonely. She didn't say lonely. She said painfully lonely. And when she was asked, why did you move to Middle Tennessee? She now lives in Franklin, Tennessee, in Williamson County in Middle Tennessee. She moved from the New York City area, a densely populated part of our country, to Middle Tennessee. When she was asked why, she said because she was dying of loneliness. Dying of loneliness. Now, one of the things that that teaches us, and I've written about that in one of my three books, if the cure for loneliness is more people, she made a big mistake leaving the New York City area where there's more people. The cure to loneliness, or the way to effectively deal with loneliness, is not more people. Now, people can help, but the solution to that loneliness is just like the solution to a lot of other personal problems. It's Jesus. It's walking closely with the Lord. But loneliness is something that's very significant with life after death. The death of your spouse, especially. How about something else? Those are two. Give me at least four more. What? They're, that feeling of lostness? Yeah, that feeling of lostness. Whenever you were making decisions, how were you making decisions when you were a couple? You made them together. Now, who's making the decisions now? You're by yourself. Unless you have helicopter children who are hovering over you, controlling you, you're going to be have to be making a lot of important decisions. One of the books that I have back there on the table, the display table, talk about how that when we've lost our spouse, it's a good thing to have a board of directors for your life. Go to people, when you feel this lostness about what to do and how to think and how to handle things, have somebody on your board of directors that you can go to if you're having issues with the house or, or the car or your finances or your relationship with the Lord, um, you know, your thought processes. Have go-to people in your life to help you. Very, because there is that lostness, that sense of lostness, because now you are by yourself. You're not being accompanied by somebody else. How about something else that you would associate with widowhood? A social awkwardness is what I call it. Do you remember, um, if you have a chance to see it during the holiday season, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, the animated version? What was the name of the island? The Island of Misfit Toys. Now, this is kind of a harsh, it's reality, though. Let's just be brutally honest. When you're widowed, you're a social misfit. Now, you're not the only social misfit. There are 20 million of us in the country, okay? But you are a social misfit because we live in a coupled world. I have a dear friend. I call her more than a friend. She lives in Addison, Texas, just outside of Dallas. As a matter of fact, she was planning to be here, but was not able to accompany us. Um, we are, I don't know if I'm ever going to let her see this video. We are married in about four or five states. Let me explain to you what I meant by that. When we are at places, when she's helping me with a workshop, what is the assumption? Because we're married. Well, we're not married. We graduated from the same high school in New Philadelphia, Ohio. Uh, we became Christians at the same church in New Philadelphia, Ohio, about an hour south of Cleveland. But the assumption is we're married. Now, why do people assume 
that when we're in public, we're married because we live in a coupled world. And here you are not a couple. Now, by the way, if you were half of a whole and the whole no longer exists, what are you? That's a pretty big question, isn't it? What, what are you? It's something you've got to, you have an identity crisis. That's what, you have an identity crisis. And you've got to sort out and figure out who you are and what you're going to be the rest of your life. And again, it's up to you to make that decision. Um, how about something else that you would associate with widowhood? Emptiness. Emptiness. That person was a part of what filled you. I mean, you proposed to that person or accepted that proposal, and you lived together, and you became very much a couple. The Bible says, two become one flesh. Well, when part of you has been emptied, you're going to feel empty. What else would you associate with widowhood? Scared. Scared. What would you have to be scared of? Your God is in heaven. Jesus Christ died for you. You have heaven to look forward to in eternity. What in the world would you have to be scared of? The guy in the car behind you. The guy in the car you. Uh, not everybody who has a driver's license ought to have a driver's license. Not everybody who's behind the wheel of a car has a driver's license. Yeah, that's something that be, can be scary. Miss Brenda? Living alone. And what about a security system? Who's your security blanket? Who's your, you know, Linus had a blanket. You know, in Charlie Brown, who's your blanket? Well, you, your blanket's gone. So there are fears that can be about finances, fears in regard to your health, you know, fears about uh, how you're going to uh, function and get around. Uh, there's a lot of things that, you know, when you were married, you could talk about some of those concerns, couldn't you? And that helps you, it's therapeutic, and it helps you to navigate living with those fears and lessening those fears and helping you cope with them effectively. And by the way, I'm sure you've heard this before, but, you know, courage is not having fear. It's facing the fear and, and living in light of the fact that there is that fear there. That's what courage is. Eliminating fear is extremely hard, and maybe even, let's say, more reasonably not possible for us human beings. We live in a fallen, broken world. Bad stuff happens. Well, when it happens to you and you're part of a couple, you have a support system. But what if something happens to you and you don't have that support system? Difficult question. Can somebody name one or two other things? Yeah. What? Yeah. The love. You're missing the love. Yeah, boy, I'll tell you, there are times, the holiday season, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Valentine's Day, birthdays, anniversaries, they're all a struggle. Well, let me, uh, thank you for uh, doing that. Uh, let's talk about, I've got a whole bunch of these and I'll just share with you quickly about this. Now, when you've lost your spouse, you're supposed to grieve, right? Now, what if you... Can you imagine a person losing their spouse, and instead of feeling grief, they feel relief? How could that possibly be? What kind of scenario would... What? The pain and agony you witnessed your spouse in, now, especially if they're a Christian, they've died, and where are they? They're in a better place, right? They're in a better state or condition. Now... The bad part about that is, you're stuck here. They're in the better place. So you have, now let's assume if you think you're supposed to be feeling grief, but then you have relief, how's that going to make you feel? You're guilty. Now, what if, what if you, you know, people cry, I'm terrible about, Cheryl Wayne, I think one reason we get along so well together is both of us are more emotional than the typical male. That's the way I'll put it. I can shed a tear at the drop of a hat. Um, Hallmark movies, I love Hallmark movies. 
Um, I had to quit watching them after my wife passed away. Um, it, took me, it took me about two or three years after my wife passed away before I could watch a Hallmark movie. I didn't listen to music. You know, so much of the music has romantic overtones to it. I didn't even listen to music for a long time after my, my wife passed away. It's just a really hard thing to, to struggle with. But here you, you, let's say you're not crying. Like you thought you were or like you've heard other people. How's that going to make you feel? Guilty. Now, what if, what if you start tearing up or crying in the presence of somebody else? What do you say? I'm sorry. What do you have to be sorry for? Absolutely nothing. Again, one of the books back there on the counter is called Don't Take My Grief Away. I love the spirit of that book. Don't let anybody take your grief away. You have nothing to apologize for. You're reeling because of a really horrific loss, and it's okay to not be okay. You have no reason to apologize. As a matter of fact, crying in the presence of somebody else is very educational to somebody who's never experienced loss because they're going to see that there's an emotional impact there. They're going to remember that whenever they see you really struggling emotionally. And then think about the heartache and the nature of that heartache. You have lost something that was the dearest person to you on earth. And that ache can cause you to have physical problems. One of the things I really encourage people to do after they've lost a loved one is get in better contact with your primary care physician because grief can cause you to have physical issues and you've got questions. Who are you going to question? What kinds of questions are you going to have after your spouse dies? What are some of the possibilities? Where do I go from here? Okay. How about another question? Now what do I do? How about another question? Why am I still here? Miss Donna? Who's going to fix the toilet now? <laughs> yeah. Amen, sister friend. Yeah. And maybe uh, even, would we be willing to admit, maybe even question God? Would we be so, would we be so honest as to admit that there might even be some of that that goes on. You know, not everybody is a person of super strong faith. And you know, if you've never experienced something in your life, and it is like a life-changing experience, it can shake you to your core, and it can cause you to think things you've never thought before, wonder about things you've never wondered before, and I'm even going to suggest it's okay for you to have a faith struggle. As a matter of fact, that's not something to be ashamed of. That's something to seek help for. That's when you find a brother or sister in the Lord that you can be transparent with. That's when you seek the assistance of shepherds in the Lord's church to help you to navigate a time when you're really struggling because you've now entered into a time that you've never, ever imagined you experiencing in your life. Remember the guy who brought the demon-possessed son to the Lord? And he said, Lord, I believe. And then what did he say right after that? Help my unbelief. Sometimes we can struggle with our faith. Even preachers. Even Christian mothers. Even husbands. Life can cause us to experience things that can really shake us. It's not something to be ashamed of to have a faith struggle. As a matter of fact, having that faith struggle can cause you to have a greater faith because you struggled. You know, some of us who may have gotten to a point in our life where we decided we needed to get more fit and we started exercising, what do we start experiencing when we exercise? Pain. Muscular pain, maybe some joint pain. But what is that painful experience all about? It's all about getting to a better place. We can get to a better place because of a faith struggle. 
So let's think about some other things. Uh, the loneliness is unparalleled. The identity crisis, who are you now? You're not any longer somebody's husband or somebody's wife. Who are you? The financial jeopardy is a possibility. You're dealing with forced change in your life and you're dealing with the absence of that person. And when you see the chair or the place where that person sat, what do you see now? You see absence. It's hard to deal with. Very hard to deal with. It's not uncommon to have dreams about that person. I've talked to uh, widowed people who over 15 years after they've lost their mate still on occasion have dreams about their mate. The vast majority of those have reported to me that they were kind of like visits and they, they kind of hated that they ended. It was kind of a blessing to them. But you're not going crazy. You don't have control over your brain when you go to sleep. Your brain's going to do whatever it wants to do. Your brain's going to be like a little kid. It's going to do whatever it wants to do. It's going to run wherever it wants to run. And you're not going crazy just because you've been dreaming a lot about the person that you've lost. That's a very human reaction. You know what widowed people often do first thing in the morning when they get up? I talked to a lot of them. Do you know what a lot of them do when they first get up in the morning? They turn on something. Could be a TV, could be a radio, because the silence can be deafening. You don't hear that person's voice anymore. You don't hear that rustling around anymore. You don't see them or hear them dropping a cup and it breaking. And isn't it funny how we used to get upset about certain things that were so trivial, but now because of loss, we've kind of got a different value system and we end up having a lot more patience and our values are different because there are a lot of things now that don't matter much at all. That, that used to kind of set us off earlier. We have to deal with the silence. We have to deal with the emptiness that we feel. And we now have a dependence that's sometimes hard for some of us older than dirt people to accept. I need help. That's a really hard thing to say for some of us people. Now, we live in a culture where we've got extremes. We've got people who are dependent to a fault. Uh, they're lazy and dependent. And a lot of times our culture enables those people, really makes it worse. Then we've got people on the other extreme, mostly with gray hair, um, and they are independent to a fault. Now, neither extreme is healthy. Do you remember when you've helped other people who needed help? How'd that make you feel? You were doing the Lord's work, and how'd it make you feel? lifted you up, made you feel good. Now, who am I to deny somebody else the uplifting experience of helping by me telling them, I don't want your help, or appear to not want their help? You know, the way God's love is displayed to other people is through God's people. Don't thwart God's love being displayed to you by refusing to accept the help of others. Let other people help you. And you insist on helping other people. You know, sometimes when, well, let me give you an example. There was this guy who had a really difficult situation uh, with his wife, and his wife became the object of a lot of caregiving. So a friend of his came to the house and said, I don't know what you're doing in regard to your landscaping, you know, your yard and your landscaping. I don't know what you used to do, but you're not doing anything now. If you were paying for it, you're not paying for it now. If you were doing it, you're not doing it now. I'm taking care of all that. I kind of wish that guy would show up at my house. <laughs> but you see that, sometimes that's what we need to do when we're seeking to help other people. We just need to go ahead and do it. I was sitting at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio, with a man in his 30s, whose wife, I was up there visiting with him and his wife. His wife was a cancer patient. We were sitting there at a snack bar, and here's what he told me one time. He said, Dean, I wish people would stop asking me, what can I do for you? When we ask somebody, what can I do for you, who are we burdening? We're burdening the person that we're asking. The better thing to do is learn about that life circumstance and then just go ahead and do stuff without even asking. 
That's a whole lot better way of doing it. And that's why I think we need to learn about life after loss because we'll know more about how to help people because we learn more about, for instance, the stress level they're dealing with and the anger that they may be dealing with. Now, who in the world would we have to be angry? Why would somebody be angry if their spouse died and now is in a better place, a place where we want to go? Why, why in the world would we be angry about that? <clears throat> because they left us. Oh, <clears throat> Jackie, down in Florida, she said after her husband died, sometimes when she'd take a shower, she'd beat the sidewall of the shower and she'd say, why did you leave me? Was she a crazy woman? Nope. She was expressing her anger. That's the way she felt. He had left her. Not by choice, but he had left her. You know, crazy things happen inside of us when we experience great loss. Remember that first session this morning? That's so critical, that's fundamental to all of this other stuff. Loss has great power to affect us. We'll think things and feel things and say things that are uncharacteristic. Now, what else might we be angry about? Or who might we be angry with? Yourself. Why would you be angry with yourself? That's a good answer. Why might you be angry with yourself? I couldn't do more. I couldn't save them. But they're drifting away from you. You can't pull them back. And you can't stop the process. But yet we can be so messed up in our head that we can be angry with ourselves as if we could control it and stop it. But we can't. But you can't tell your feeler that, and your feeler's, feeler's running in overdrive, and your thinker's not working so good, it's probably in park. What else might you be angry with or about? You might be angry at a caregiver who assisted you, maybe with all good intent, but they're humans. You know, human caregivers are going to make mistakes. And that might even be a problem with our anger in regard to ourselves. Maybe we feel like we could have done a better job. And so we can be angry about that. Yes, ma'am. Angry that you didn't get all the passwords to all of the uh, utilities, the bank accounts, uh, oh, the internet system, mm. and that really does complicate things greatly. Angry at God. Thank you for mentioning that. Until they realize, yeah. Angry with God. Um, remember what I said, uh, keep this in mind. This would be a good thing to write down on that notepad. Not everything that happens in this world is God's will, but in everything that happens, God has a will. Not everything that happens in this world is what God wants. And sometimes, sometimes we give people the impression that God did it to them. Because sometimes people interpret that God's will phrase. If you say, well, it must have been God's will, what do most people probably think from that? that God did it, or that God wanted it to be. How would you know that? What Bible verse would, would you be able to identify that would have that person's name in it and the date in it to indicate that you knew for a fact that it was God's will? We need to be real careful about using that phrase, God's will, unless we explain what we meant. And that's why I say, not everything that happens in this world is God's will. I'm talking about God's will in the sense of what God desires. But in everything that happens, God does have a will. He does have a desire that he be glorified and that we be a blessing to others. That's always his will. In great prosperity, that's his will. In great adversity, that is his will. God doesn't cause all this bad stuff to happen. Now, I do have to confess, though, he does permit all the bad stuff to happen. Did God permit Eve to eat the apple? She was deceived. And that husband of hers, what a bonehead. 1 Timothy 2 says, he wasn't deceived, and he went ahead and ate it anyway. What does that tell you about him? I mean, come on. Or like some famous person says, come on, man. Um, you know, it just... <laughs> human beings 
have the freedom to choose, and sometimes we, we don't choose good. Even the best of us, on occasion, sometimes don't choose good. And, but we've got to deal with the anger that we... Sometimes we might be angry at the medical profession. They made a mistake. Well, who are the medical profession? Human beings. Human beings don't know everything. I, I describe the medical profession this way. Three words. Three phrases. Um, educated is one word. Experienced is another word. Ignorance is another word. The medical profession is educated, experienced, guesswork. They are ignorant of what a procedure or a medication will do to one single body. If that one single body has never been through that treatment or that medication, they don't know. It's guesswork. It's called a practice for a reason. Sometimes we can be angry at the medical profession. But you see all this stuff that's going on inside of us, how messed up we are? We can have worries and fears about things that we hadn't thought about, you know, worrying about or being fearful about when we were married as much. And the restlessness, the tossing and turning, the wanting, don't you wish that God gave, don't you wish that there was something here where you could turn your brain off? Don't you wish you could do? Now, I used to tell my mother-in-law that. I, I, Mama Bear, that's what I used to call her, Mama Bear, just turn your brain off. She talked about how difficult it was to go to sleep sometimes. And then it dawned on me, if God had given us a way to turn it off, how would we have known to turn it back on in the morning? <laughs> We'd have to designate somebody that we trusted to come turn it back on for us. So we've got a brain, and that brain's going to cause us to be restless. And then there was that guy in Chester, West Virginia, that mentioned about this. He came to me and he said, Dean, I think there's something else that you ought to add to that list of things. And he's the one that said suicidal thoughts. He was probably in his early 80s, bald-headed guy. I could tell that the tears were beginning to form in his eyes when he said that. Have you ever thought about the people you're going to church with? Have you ever thought about how some of them worshiping with you that week that's passed or maybe that day? They'd had suicidal thoughts because of what they were going through in their life. Oh, if we could only be more transparent with one another when we're struggling. How much help could we be to one another if we knew more about one another? Why is this such a difficult thing to lose a spouse? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the nature of the relationship. The only human relationship described in the Bible with this phrase, one flesh. The only one. That phrase is not used in regard to the parent-child relationship, the child-parent relationship, kiss-and-cousin relationship, friendship relationship, only the marriage relationship, one flesh. That relationship is really unique. And when you stop to think about marriage, here's what it's all about. Take this and sell it to every married person you know. You cannot have a perfect marriage. You can't take two imperfect human beings, put them together, and create something perfect. But you can take two flawed human beings, and you can create something that is magnificent. Here's the recipe for a magnificent marriage. When two people buy in to the total giving of the total self for a total lifetime, that is how you make a magnificent marriage. Now, you know there's only one way for a magnificent marriage to end. That's the bad part. That's the hard part. And when you lose that magnificent marriage, you're going to struggle. Now, the way you struggle is going to be different depending on you and a lot of other things. Don't ever say to a widowed person, even if you're a widowed person, I know how you feel because you don't. You can't. It's not possible. How long has that person been married? Well, Brittany there in West Tennessee, I told you about, married a little over 1,300 days. Millie was married to that second husband for 63 years. She was married to Ray Farmer only a brief period of time prior to those 63 years. The length of time your marriage is going to impact your widowhood. Your family is going to impact your widowhood, your individuality. Your faith, not everybody has a great faith. Some of us have maybe a mediocre faith. Some of us maybe very little faith. Your faith is going to affect your widowhood. 
your family, some families are very dysfunctional. Some families don't communicate. I know that there are going to be families this uh, holiday season when they sit down together uh, to eat a meal. There are some families that are going to ignore the white elephant in the room. Don't do that. Um, talk about the white elephant. Spend some time just briefly. You don't have to let it totally cloud uh, the holiday experience, but don't ignore it either. Uh, some people have even gone to certain lengths, like having an empty chair and an empty plate at the table, and then talking about it. Uh, you can uh, ask people to go around the table, maybe, and talk about some memory that they have of that person. Uh, just don't ignore it, uh, because it's going to matter. The fact that they're gone is going to matter. So just you know, face that. Give it a little bit of time so that you can talk about that sort of thing. But all these things are going to factor into how your widowhood is going to be, and it's going to be unique for you. Cheryl Wayne has a gift. Uh, I wouldn't call it a priceless gift, but I would call it a gift of value. He's going to give you, if you're widowed, uh, raise your hand and make sure that Cheryl Wayne gets you one of these forks. Now, if you want to lose weight, use this fork to eat with, okay? If that's what you want to do, uh, then use this fork, it'll help you lose weight. But that's not the reason that you're given this fork. Here's what I want you to do with this fork. I want you to take this fork home with you, and I want you to put this fork somewhere where you'll see it frequently. I've heard of some people putting it on their nightstand, some people on the kitchen counter. Raise your hand if you are widowed. We want you to get one of these forks. But lay it maybe somewhere where that person sat, if there's a table near where that person sat, but someplace where you'll see it frequently. Now here's what I want you to think about. When you pick up this fork, no, well, when you pick up a normal fork, what have you decided to do? Eat, okay, now, what other decisions follow that? You've decided to eat, with your fork in hand, what other decisions are you making? What other decisions are you making? What to eat? What are you going to eat, and in what order are you going to eat? What else are you having to think about? How much are you going to eat? Am I ever going to quit eating? Uh, there's all kinds of decisions that you're making. Let this fork remind you of decisions. In your grief journey, down the road of your grief journey, at some point in time, after you've deeply grieved a horrific loss, and you need to spend time investing in that experience, don't deny yourself of the grief you need. You need it because you're human. So when you see this fork, think about the decisions you need to make about your life. You've come to a fork in your road. Now you need to start making some decisions. What am I going to do with the rest of my life? Whenever I lost my wife, I prayed about some things very passionately. Let me share with you three. Number one, that God would open a door of opportunity for me so that I could keep serving him in his name. I needed to leave the church that I'd been with for 33 years. About a year previous to that ending, I had resigned as the pulpit minister to be like an associate minister so I could have more time to spend with my wife and care for her. I needed some place that would accept me. So I asked the Lord to open a door of opportunity to continue to minister. The second thing I did was I prayed for the vision to see the open door. Sometimes God opens doors for us in our life, but we're so busy with the trivial things in our life that we don't see the open door. Or sometimes we're so blinded by our burdens that we're bearing, we don't see the open doors. I asked the Lord to give me the vision to see the open door. And then I ask the Lord for the courage to walk through the open door. It takes a lot of courage to open and then walk through a door that you've never been through in your life. Especially if you've gotten used to a routine for several years or maybe a few decades. Well, here was my plight. When my daughters left, 
to go back to their respective homes in southeast part of the United States, Middle Tennessee, Gainesville, Florida, and then the Atlanta, Georgia area. Before they left, I said, look, girls, I know what I need to do. I know I need to move down in the southeast part of the country. I'm way up almost at Lake Erie in the Great Lakes. But I said, girls, I've got three strikes against me. I said, number one, I'm 61 years old. What church wants a 61-year-old preacher? I'm not very marketable at 61. I said, number two, I'm a widower. The only thing worse than being 61 years old and church shopping for a place to preach is to not have a wife. And I said, number three, I'm a Yankee. And I don't even talk like those people down there in the southeast part of the country. And I said, in baseball, three strikes is not good. It's going to be hard. It was hard, and it was harder than I ever thought. I finally found a little church in Crockett County, Tennessee. A church that was grieving because they were not the church they used to be. They used to be a church of about 130 on Sunday morning. They were down to about 50 when I arrived there. They were heartbroken and grieving. They'd been through a terrible, divisive situation. So they were a heartbroken church. I was a heartbroken preacher. And finally, after going to a lot of different states, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, North Carolina, Tennessee, I didn't want to cross the river to Arkansas. Arkansas is on my list of states I never want to live in. Uh, but anyway, uh, they accepted me, and we started a local widowhood ministry there. Now, I told them that's the one thing that I insisted on if I were to move somewhere. I said, I want the church to embrace the widowhood workshop ministry concept. I want to start a local widowhood ministry. Myself and about four widowed females started that ministry. And we did everything. We did all the planning, all the prep work, and we funded it all ourselves and did all the cooking, all the decorating, and we started inviting widowed people from all over to come. And that grew from about a half a dozen to over a dozen to over 20 to over 30 to over 40. Some months we had over 50 people there. They came from four different counties. Over half of the people who were there were not members of the Lord's Church. They came from all different kinds of churches. It was a great outreach. We helped some of those people find the Lord and find His church. It's a great outreach ministry. In Limestone County, there are over a thousand widowed females. If you count the widowed males, there's probably nearly 2,000 widowed people in Limestone County. What a great thing it would be in this county for this church to be known as the church that really ministers, encourages the widowed. So one of the things we do is we help churches start those kinds of things. And as a matter of fact, one of the handouts that you have is about widowhood fellowships, which I think is a very important part of local widowhood ministries. Helen Keller, you know about her story, I'm sure. I was able to see her home in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. She was so bright and such an inspiration, though so burdened in her life. When one door of happiness closes, another opens, but often... We look so long at the closed door, we do not see the one that's been opened for us. I'm not suggesting that we move on with our life and forget about grieving. One of the worst mistakes we can make is to deny the fact that we've suffered great loss and we're hurting a lot. But what we need to do is engage in that deep grieving as long as we need to, in whatever way we need to, but at some point in time, we've got to see we've come to the fork in the road. And we've got to start making some decisions in our life. There's all kinds of choices that we're going to have to make, too. Now, we're released and free as far as the marital responsibilities are concerned. But one Sunday night, Carolyn Smith in Murray City, Tennessee, said to me, because I think she was prompted to ask this question because I still had my wedding ring on. She said, Dean, do you still feel married? And I said, no, Miss Carolyn, I don't. Miss Carolyn said she still felt married. Her husband died in an industrial accident. He fell out of a 
high stretched up bucket and died because of that fall. I talk to a lot of widowed people that still feel married, even years after they've been married. And I mean no offense by saying this, but your feelings are not reality. My feelings are not reality. The reality is you're no longer married. In the perspective of God, you're released and free of those responsibilities. You may not feel like it, but you are. Now, what are you going to do when you're not married? Well, there's some unique phrases used in 1 Corinthians 7 to describe somebody who is not married. And basically the point of those descriptions are when you're not married, you have less responsibility. See, when you're hitched, you're hitched to a lot of responsibilities because you are married. That person needs to be your first human priority in your life. That's a lot of responsibility. That person is no longer with you. So all the time and effort that you invested in that relationship, what are you going to do with all of that time and energy now? That's something you've got to decide about. One thing's for sure, you're more available now, you're more flexible now, and now you're more experienced than you've ever been before. So my suggestion is, over here on this wall, another one of the mottos of the Widowhood Workshop Ministry, my suggestion is, don't die until you're dead. Now, they're dead, but you're not dead. So you keep living. After you've deeply grieved, find some way that you can move on in your life and use to have a meaningful, full life. Moving on with your life doesn't mean any disrespect to the person who's passed on. It doesn't mean that they didn't matter because they did matter and they still do matter and they will matter the rest of your life. No matter whether you remarry or don't, that's the reality. You've got to live with that loss in your life the rest of your life. Whatever you do, you've got to live with it the rest of your life. Well, why not take that and understand that you're now in a period of time where it's not just a life of grief, but it's a life of transition, it's a life of adjustment, it's also a life of opportunity. One door has been slammed shut and locked, and whether or not you want to or not, you cannot go through that slammed shut locked door. So begin looking for an open door. What can you do with the rest of your life? Create some sort of a new normal, a new beginning, because now it's you. What's that new beginning or new normal going to be? It's going to be whatever you decide. As a matter of fact, your future from that point forward is up to you. What are you going to do with the rest of your life? It's different for different people. But one thing I know for sure, your spouse may be dead, but those of us left behind are not. Sometimes what people do is they die when their spouse dies. What they do is when their spouse dies, they begin to exist. Existing is not living. We are here to seek the Lord. You can read Acts 17 about this. We were created by God. We are His offspring, and we are to seek the Lord. If happily, we might find Him. He's not far from any one of us. Whether we're married or whether we're single, whether we're divorced or whether we're widowed, we are created to seek the Lord and to bring glory to Him in that seeking. And also, we can find great fulfillment and contentment in that life. Don't just exist. Learn to live. It takes a while to learn to live. The last session, we're going to take a break. We're going to make it a five-minute session so we can jump on it and we can be done before the 2.30 time. The last session, I want to admit to you, I avoided when I started this ministry because I didn't want to go there. And I read about and I write about so people can read about this very personal part of my journey after my wife died in that third book I wrote, After the End Comes. Whenever my wife died, for a few years I considered all you ladies, don't take this personal. I considered all women forbidden fruit. That's, that's the terminology in my thought process. All women are forbidden fruit. 
And the reason why I did that is because I knew as a human male that it might be real easy for me to seek a second relationship before I was in a right place to be somebody else's mate. And it would be bad for me, bad for her, and most importantly, bad for the Lord. And I didn't want that to happen. So I avoided talking about this whole business of marriage after loss. Now, it's funny, I've had people come to me and say they were never going to get married. And you know what happened? Then they have to come and confess to me. Because it can happen. And even if that's not in your thought process, you know, there are people that you can help if you know a little bit more about this marriage after loss thing. It's only going to take about 40 minutes to deal with this last session. So please be willing to stay because I think there are going to be a lot of things that could be very helpful, if not to you, to help you help other people. Uh, let's take a break. Thank you very much for your attention. Take a look at the table back there in the back and this one up in the front. And don't forget my prunes. If you want it to be a moving experience this weekend, <clears throat> there are individually wrapped prunes back there on the table. I highly recommend them. <laughs>